um, HSC University. And um, today our Department of International Relations and International Laboratory on World Order Studies and the New Regionalism of the National Research University High School of Economics is holding the 30th session of our Eurasian online seminar. Um, today we again have a discussion panel, which, uh, which is great, great format, I think. Um, and um, it's a presentation of the special issue of the Russian Politics Journal. Um, it's volume six, um, 2021, issue four, um, from October 2021. Um, it's on Russian foreign policy and it's edited by Ian Ferguson, Andrei Kritskovic, um, Alexander Lukin and Richard Sakwa. Um, Russian Politics is an international peer-reviewed journal. Um, it's relatively young, um, however, already very renowned um, and uh, predominantly examines the scholarship of intersections between Russian studies and politics, law, economy and history. Um, now, not all of the authors of the issue are present with us today. Some of them have already presented within this, uh, the framework of this seminar um, and um, answered um, to some tough questions from the audience. For example, we had a session with Vladimir Lukin. If you're curious, it's all on our website. Um, so he already spoke um, about his contribution to this. Um, all editors of the issue, however, are here. Um, it's Alexander, Andre, Richard and Ian. Thanks very much. Um, I am going to announce the order of the speakers now. So um, both to the audience and to the speakers. So um, the order is going to be as follows. Um, Professor Karaganov um, and uh, it is going to go um, first. Um, the second one is going to be um, Anastasia Likachova, who's our uh, Dean of um, the Faculty um, of World Economy and International Relations. Um, and number three, we have um, either Alexander or Vladimir Rushkov. Uh, then we have um, Richard Sakwa, Andre, um, and Ian Ferguson um, at the very end of our session. Um, now, every one of the presenters, um, I'd please ask you to speak for no more than 10 minutes sharp. Uh, because after that, I'm going to have to uh, rudely interrupt you. Sorry about that um, in advance. Uh, the Q&A session will follow um, at the end um, of the whole thing. So after we're done with all the presentations, um, the audience is going to have a chance um, to um, interact with the speakers as well. Um, if you're familiar with the format, you know that I should just put um, either put your name and the question um, in the chat window and then I'll um, read it out or you can also um, ask it yourself at the end of the session. But please feel free to write down your name and specify that you'd like to ask the question in this case then. Um, thanks a lot. Um, now, um, I'm going to send you a link to the special issue now um, in the chat window just so that everybody could uh, Take a look. Um, it's not um, open access, unfortunately, but if um, any of you require copies um, of the articles, um, please do um, email us, let us know, and we'll send you um, the PDFs uh, if you're curious. Um, all right, so um, I think we are uh, more or less ready to go um, if Professor Karaganov joined us. Let me just see. Um, so the contents of the special issue um, is accessible via that link. Um, and um, it starts off with uh, Professor Karagan of discussing Russian foreign policy um, and three historical stages and two future scenarios. Um, then um, there's an article of Vladimir Lukin. Uh, Vladimir has already presented um, his view um, in, a sem in one of the se sessions. Um, recent ones. Um, his article is called A Multi-Level World and a Flat World View, a Realist and Progressive Synthesis for Russia. Um, then we have um, Ian Ferguson and Sergei Akopov as well, um, who are discussing the politics of Russian revisionism, diplomacy of a worldview. Um, then um, Anastasia Likachova's article on Russia and sanctions, the trans transformational uh, domestic and international effects of unilateral restrictive measures. Um, Russia's policies in the post-Soviet space between constructive relations and fighting the new Cold War. Um, this is Andrei Kazantsev, Sergei Lebedev and Svetlana Medvedeva. Um, then we have Russia's China policy, uh, growing asymmetries and hedging options by Igor Denisov and Alexander Lukin. Um, and from greater Europe to confrontation.
quotation. Is a common European home still possible by Vladimir Rishkov? Um, right, so um, if Professor Karaganov um, is with us, then we are ready to start. Um, Professor Karaganov. Um, if you need a minute, we can start with another presentation. That's fine as well. We cannot hear you. Sergey Alexandrovich, microphone выключен. Сергей Александрович, микрофон выключен. А, а сейчас нормально, да. Somebody else to start, and then I will join, okay? Yeah, could we start with Vladimir Rishkov then? Because I see Vladimir is present. Absolutely. Are we okay to start with Vladimir Rishkov? Gosh, nobody wants to go first today. Um, Vladimir, can you hear us? We cannot hear you because the microphone is muted. Yeah, okay. Yeah, now, now you let me switch yes. on, on the, <laughs> the sound. Look, I am here. I am in uh, Moscow State Parliament now. It's uh, it's a really plenary session of Moscow City Parliament. I recently was elected as a member of, of the parliament. So you can see how it's happening in new world. So we, we, we have now online session, you see? It's a real parliamentary session in, in, in Zoom, like us, like us. So I, I, I am very glad to uh, I, I am very glad to see you everybody, and I wrote article about uh, history of Russia EU relations, and I will be oh, I will be very very brief. If you look back uh, in, in the past, uh, our relations uh, Soviet Union and Russia with uh, United Europe started on a very good note. We remember Gorbachev, we remember new thinking, we remember Paris uh, Charter of uh, uh, CSU, we remember uh, Gorbachev's speeches in the General Assembly of UN, we remember his idea of common European, uh, common European house, common European home. And we could say that uh, Russia-EU relations uh, had three main stages. In the 90s, Russia, uh, tried as well as Europe to create partnership, then strategic partnership. Russia tried to, to make uh, possible integration, especially economic integration with, uh, uh, with European Union. But even those time, there were some uh, contradictions between Russian view and European view. For instance, Gor both Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin being against NATO enlarge enlargement, and, uh, and fight for common European security system, which was uh, impossible those time and still is possible. Then when Vladimir Putin came to Kremlin, relations between EU and Russian Federation became, an, became even better. Uh, many very ambitious initiatives have been uh, started like four common spaces, common ener energy policy, and as Romana Prodi said, integ whole integration, uh, excluding institutions, everything but not institutions. And the peak of these strategic relations between Russia and EU was St. Petersburg summit, uh, 2003, when we could impression that future relations will be, will be extremely good. But then uh, some events, Yuka's case, uh, increasing autocratic uh, uh, tendencies in Russian domestic policy, increasing tensions on post-Soviet space, uh, failure with new agreement between Russia and uh, European Union, relations uh, became less and less 
uh, efficient, less and less successful. And all this period finished by Crimea crisis 2014. And after Crimea crisis, after 2014, we have uh, not only stagnation, but we have systemic confrontation between Russia and European Union. And in my article, I tried uh, to think what, what were the reasons of this failure, failure of uh, cooperation, strategic cooperation, integration between Russia and European Union. And my conclusion is that uh, there were two main reasons. First main reason uh, uh, was domestic development of EU and Russia. European Union in the 90s uh, was fully involved in uh, interior reforms. Maastricht uh, the treatment, common currency, um, uh, single market, and so on. And the main focus was in the European Union on domestic reforms. Same was in Russia. Russia was focused on domestic reforms, and there was no big there was no big cooperation between two sides those time. Then, when Russia became to, 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 to be stronger and, uh, and started to restore state and economy, way of this restoration was not European, was not liberal, was not European-like. Uh, political regime, economic system, uh, regulation was not European-like, European style. And two models of European Union and Russia in new century divided more and more uh, every year. And then, and then foreign policy, Russia uh, became more and more oriented on sovereignty, independent foreign policy, more and more critical towards West, towards uh, NATO enlargement and so on. And now we have situation and we have consensus among uh, experts, among specialists that in coming 10 years, we don't have any, uh, any hopes, any perspectives on a real uh, uh, reintegration, a real restoration of strategic partnership. Uh, we will have uh, more or less selective engagement or uh, called neighborhood. Uh, and at the same time, very different domestic models and very different, very different uh, foreign policy perspectives. And, I think that this uh, conflicting uh, these different models will stay at least next 10 years without real hopes on, on, on uh, a restoration of great Europe, uh, uh, common European home and so on concepts. But there are some good news for us. I, I think that we, have, we still have some uh, basic factors making Russia and Europe in future very important for each other and basic factors of possible future uh, going, uh, going uh, one side to another side of uh, restoring of strategic partnership. Of course, among these uh, factors, there are such as uh, 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 Culture, Russian culture is European culture. Uh, history, Russian state and Russian society is European state and European society. Uh, historically, Russia for last three centuries is a part of concert of great European uh, states. Russia and European Union are close neighbors and they have complex uh, networks, networking in different spheres of relations. Russia and European Union still are deeply uh, uh, involved in economic uh, relations, trade, investment, transport, infrastructure, and so on. Uh, Russia and European Union both deeply uh, believe in uh, international institutions and international law, UN, and so on. Russia is extremely important for Europe in climate, uh, in climate agenda, which is number one priority for European Union for next decade. Russia is necessary for Europe for creating European security system. Russia has 
objective necessity for modernization of uh, technology, economy, infrastructure, and society, and European Union is still the best partner for doing that. Uh, until now, Russian civil society and business has deep sympathies to European civil society, business, and culture. Uh, and common uh, competitors, US and China, make a challenge both for European Union and for Russia. So basic factors are still very strong. And I believe that in the next decade, these basic factors of creating new partnerships, strategic partnerships will still, will, still, will still exist. And plus, we need not only factors, but concrete conditions for that. And the main conditions, conditions for restarting Russia-European cooperation, I personally uh, see that first condition is successful in uh, a successful reform of EU itself, because if EU will be reformed successfully, EU will be attractive again, like in the 90s for Russia. Second concrete conditions, successful domestic reform in Russia, including uh, legislation reform, political reform, economic reform, institutional reform, and so on. Russia must to be reformed successfully and this successful reform, which is possible still, could create good conditions for relations with the uh, with European Union. And if we think on future on uh, international conditions for restarting cooperation, uh, first, a decision of European security problem. Second, minimal consensus between EU and Russia on uh, territory of common neighborhood, neighborhood, and Armenia could be a good example. Armenia is member of Euros Eurozine integration and at the same time has privileged uh, 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 treaty with the European Union. It could be a good model for, for, for others. Number three, climate and techno technological challenges which, which, which will push Russia and EU for more cooperation. Number four, Competitors, as I said previously, China and, and United States could, could, um, could invent Russia and EU for new cooperation and new form of this cooperation. And the last condition, both sides could be more moderate, could be more cautious in rhetoric, actions, uh, not to provocate new, new conflicts and new confrontations between two sides. So my conclusion common conclusion that our history is very long and complicated. Now we are in systemic confrontation, but still we have basic factors and possible conditions, conditions for restarting this great idea, which I very much like, common Europe, great Europe, common European house. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is great. Um, so a uh, view from Vladimir Rishkov on Greater Eurasia uh, from Greater Europe to Confrontation. Um, and yeah, I hope it wasn't classified what you showed us <laughs> about participating in both yes, <laughs> sessions. <we'll be. laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, right. So um, we are now ready to um, give the floor to Professor Karaganov, um, if you're ready. So if you could please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you uh, very much for, for waiting for a while. Um, I am in, uh, in the preparation of a meeting. Uh, so necessarily I will be around to brief. Now, uh, first, um, in spite of our um, uh, different outlooks with uh, Valodya Rishkov, I agree with his um, uh, with his uh, basically with his analysis, uh, and my analysis in my chapter is more or less um, along the same lines. Uh, 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 however, uh, and of course, I, I it is a simplistic analysis; it's oversimplification. But after reading it uh, a, a couple of days ago, uh, I must say that I would. Uh, uh, still um, sign uh, most of the thesis of my analysis. However, 
I think uh, that we are entering a, a somewhat difficult, uh, different um, uh, period in Russian foreign policy. Uh, uh, so uh, I enumerated three stages. Uh, if um, uh, you remember, uh, I think we are, uh, but then I uh, put a huge question mark uh, as to where we are going, and uh, I'm not willing at that juncture, which was about two years ago, almost two years ago, uh, to prognosticate them I mean, firmly. I said that everything will develop, uh, will, will depend, most of the things will depend on internal. Uh, situation in Russia. Uh, and, uh, it was um, uh, correct, uh, as uh, all kind of predictions like that. Uh, however, I must say that uh, since that time, uh, the development of international affairs uh, have shown that we are entering into a new period. Uh, the challenges are building up. Uh, the problems are not solved. And it seems that uh, Russia uh, finally is on the verge of the fourth stage uh, in its uh, uh, foreign policy, and that is assertive behavior. Now, uh, we saw that uh, uh, in the Valdai speech of uh, President Putin, uh, whereas for the first time, uh, he openly uh, uh, started uh, to uh, 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 to line down um, the, the ideological foundations of Russia, and that is of a, of a normal country uh, 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 defending uh, normal human values. Uh, you could you should read that article uh, that that speech uh, much more attentively. Uh, uh, it is not. Uh, at all, at all, I mean, confrontation or challenging, as for example, uh, the Munich speech was, but it is you know, quite profound. And uh, so the second element is, of course, that Russia, uh, for the first time, and uh, in my view, at last, has uh, uh, stated that it is not content uh, with this uh, status quo uh, being prolonged. Uh, in Europe, and that is uh, that it openly uh, asks or demands uh, for security guarantees. It is a huge question in uh, firm security. How could possibly our uh, Western partners provide for security guarantees under circumstances uh, of, uh, of its uh, uh, inner crisis, uh, both uh, uh, in terms of internal policies and in terms of decision making? However, the uh, demand has been made. And uh, uh, now the question is, of course, uh, would Russia deliver? Or what will be the direction of our Western partners? Uh, but uh, from my point of view, and I hear I would agree uh, with uh, uh, the member, uh, with um, our friend, um, uh, uh, Sergei Repkov, uh, for the, uh, the deputy, the deputy farmer minister. I think that our Western um, partners do not understand that they are driving the situation towards the Caribbean crisis. Uh, whereas Russia has, I mean, much more uh, stronger uh, positions uh, than in the Caribbean crisis uh, of um, 40 years ago. Uh, I hope, however, that there will be uh, forces in Europe, though I do not see them yet, uh, who will um, uh, be able and willing uh, to respond to, to the challenge. So the fourth uh, stage in Russian foreign policy has started. Uh, I am uh, concerned, uh, but I also I am invigorated by uh, the fact that at last uh, Russia uh, has moved out of the situation which, uh, uh, whereas um, in which she has been during uh, several years, or last several years, uh, which was, uh, as I uh, described it in my chapter, a, a plateau, a plateau uh, um, uh, uh, with inclination down. 
now uh, it is not uh, anymore a uh, plateau. Russia has decided to uh, openly challenge uh, the status quo. Uh, it is dangerous, uh, but it is the only way out, uh, I believe, uh, because otherwise, I mean, uh, sitting on that plateau, uh, both um, Russia and Europeans uh, would have inevitably, inevitably uh, brought us uh, to a crisis which we could not control. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> right, thank you so much. Um, it's great to see that we can have a whole number of different views on different issues here represented, even within just one journal, and all peacefully coexist. Great. Um, it's great to see um, Sergei Karaganov, um, who just provided us some um, insights on the historical status and future scenarios for Russia. Um, now, I'm very happy to give the floor to um, Anastasia Likachova. Is going to talk about Russia and sanctions, the transformational domestic and international effects of unilateral restrictive measures, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Well, thank you. Thank you, Olga, and thank you to organizers for this uh, discussion. Uh, I would like personally uh, express my gratitude to the editors and especially to Andrei Krikovic, who carefully worked with my uh, first draft, second draft, third draft of the chapter, and uh, finally now I'm happy to present an edited um, contribution and uh, the role of uh, Professor Krishkovich is huge because uh, the issue I would like to develop, uh, to develop, and I hope that I develop to some extent, uh, goes in fact far broader than just the discussion about Russian sanctions for a couple of um, a recent couple of weeks. Uh, there were lots of uh, new waves of talk about what kind of new bills from hell or um, dreadful sanctions uh, could be imposed now because uh, of some possible risks that could appear. Uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and uh, there was a new wave of discussions uh, which effects um, some particular sanctions could uh, cause, could launch. Um, it also may uh, work as a catalyst for reverse discussion that in fact sanctions didn't harm too much or Russian economy learned how to deal with sanctions. So in fact, uh, the issues I try to develop in my chapter, they try to analyze not the immediate effects of some particular sanctions since 2014 and in fact 2013, if we encounter also the Magnitsky Act, uh, there were lots of waves of uh, sanctions, all kind of, to, uh, of types of tools, uh, of sanction tools uh, were imposed, sectoral, personal, uh, some partial restrictive measures, informal sanctions that also uh, have pretty profound effect, uh, construction of sanction expectations. And uh, by now in um, about seven years, uh, it was very interesting for me, uh, which indirect effects uh, sanctions uh, uh, created not just for Russian economy, but for Russian international strategies and to some extent Russian domestic strategies. Um, most of study, most studies of the US or European or even Ukrainian sanctions against Russia and our countermeasures focus on the immediate effects. And in my chapter, um, the readers could find a pretty detailed uh, representation of existing studies uh, that try to evaluate uh, some particular effects on investments, on uh, trade, on GDP, on um, some uh, in the, uh, sectoral aspects of Russian economy. And I can only welcome scholars who develop that kind of evaluations. Um, however, I try to focus on uh, a bit different issues. Uh, first of all, the factor of vulnerability that uh, does not uh, strictly correlate, in fact, with the scale of sanctions being imposed. But what I prove in my chapter, uh, this feeling of vulnerability, assessment of vulnerability to sanctions, mostly correlate with um, uh, persistence of sanction policy. So if the expectations of targeted country in my chapter is Russia, are uh, completely um, mm, incorporates sanction risks in their long-term strategies, it leads not just to various strategies on how to provide uh, sustainability, not in ASG terms, but in uh, financial terms, 
or how to minimize direct sanction effects. But this uh, vulnerability factor drives uh, national authorities to reconstruct profoundly their domestic industrial or uh, economic or in even international strategies in terms of diversification of the, of, the, of the cooperation. The second issue I focus on is um, the idea that sanctions were a, were a very intense catalyst for Moscow's efforts to diversify its economic relationships with non-Western um, parties. Uh, first of all, uh, Eurasian Economic Union project uh, got a serious boost uh, right after the sanction imposed uh, since 2015. BRICS action and most of BRICS institutional decisions, including New Development Bank of BRICS, it's also some 15. Uh, Russian uh, conjunction, um, Russian initiated conjunction of um, Eurasian Economic Union and Belt and Road Initiative, it's also 2015. So uh, I would say that 2015, maybe 16, but mostly 15, was the picking year for diversification of Russian foreign policy. And here we also could um, evaluate the role of sanctions. Most of these uh, international activities didn't provide immediate enriching and prosperity effect for Russian economy. But first of all, they um, provided a set of, uh, not an insurance fee, but uh, some status um, boost booster uh, that was very important for Russian authorities. Because uh, what is uh, really dramatic about sanctions uh, being imposed uh, against Russia in 2014 wasn't just their economic effect. In fact, sanctions of 2014 weren't so dramatic compared to sanctions that uh, are imposed now over uh, China, Chinese companies or Iran, or I'm not speaking about North Korea. But the idea that uh, the principle of inferiority, the principle of hierarchy could um, be integrated in Russian everyday modus operandi in international affairs, that was an acceptable idea. That's why uh, most of official comments of Russian officials that I provide in my chapter, you know, in my article, they uh, uh, underline an acceptance of the very idea of unilateral sanctions against Russia, against all other countries as well, but uh, the key point was always related to Russia. However, the idea that uh, diversification of international projects, not only relations, could be uh, some kind of uh, protection against this um, hierarchical approach, um, in fact, was proved by the practice and uh, some slow down in most of these activities in the recent, in the very recent years, all, not just because of the COVID, but because of the uh, um, sufficiency of uh, existing status for Moscow do correlate with sanction activity of the first years. Second, what we see uh, and what I prove in the chapter is that sanctions have triggered more risk sensitive policies in the provision of national economic security, particularly when it comes to finance, but it also became some uh, uh, basic etiquette for Russian uh, national development programs. It can be a space development program, it can be a microelectronic development program or um, other issues. Olga, I'm sorry, I see your hand. Do you want uh, to? Yeah, it's just to gently remind you of the time limit. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm finishing. It's just exactly the last phrase. Um, last couple of phrases. Um, uh, the All these uh, national food security program, they all do encounter the risk of sanctions nowadays. Not because sanctions didn't exist to, before 2014 in principle, but because now uh, that's the must to evaluate this risk uh, and to minimize possible risks in the future that also changes international relations. And uh, what I also see are uh, these kind of sanctions serve as, in fact, as transformational tool for national development strategies. When we now analyze how Russia, for example, plans to develop its uh, Northern territories in the Arctic, or how to modernize its uh, oil and uh, gas industry, everywhere we will see the effect of sanctions, uh, both at the industrial levels that I 
also prove at, at the regional levels in terms of some specific activities with uh, East Asian countries or with uh, international development institutions. So my chapter provides some brief uh, or sometimes detailed analysis of these non-direct effects of sanctions and um, I hope that it can also contribute to the search of the answer how does the existing political crisis between Russia and the West uh, can be evaluated through some particular national documents, doctrines and strategies. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Anastasia. Uh, we now have Alexander looking with Russia's China policy, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be very brief uh, because everyone, of course, who wants to do it can read the article, not only my articles, but all the articles there. Well, the, um, uh, I, I wrote an article with my friend and colleague, uh, Igor Denisov, uh, on Russian-Chinese relations. Um, and uh, it's kind of hot topic recently, maybe not as hot as Russian relations with Ukraine, say, but also rather hot because today, uh, for example, the, there was a summit which has just finished uh, a virtual summit between um, our two leaders, uh, President Putin and uh, Chairman Xi Jinping. Uh, we don't even have uh, information about what was discussed, but only, only some official statements at the beginning of the meeting. But anyway, um, uh, some people tend to uh, misrepresents my recent articles uh, about Russian-Chinese relations and uh, think about them as if I, I became a pes uh, more pessimistic about the future of uh, bilateral relations, which is not exactly true. Um, in this article, its first uh, part actually uh, devoted to uh, citing some facts and some tendencies and also uh, explaining history of Russian-Chinese relations, uh, and it says that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, say, uh, and it basically argues that uh, the current rapprochement was a logical and kind of inevitable uh, tendency for two main reasons. First, there is a natural, uh, natural wish of uh, two uh, big countries uh, and neighbors to cooperate in the economic, in the, uh, to have a uh, broad economic cooperation because um, China is, for example, first Russian, Russia's uh, trading partner since uh, tw uh, the year 2010, already more than 10 years, if we, if we count by countries, not by uh, not European Union as a whole. European Union as a whole, or as an organization, is still first uh, Russia's trading partner, but its share is uh, going down, while uh, the share of China is increasing. Uh, and the second reason is, uh, of course, the geopolitical situation. And here we have a good uh, uh, help from the United States, which uh, government decided to contain Russia and China at the same time, and which uh, plays a, uh, a big positive role in creating a Russian-Chinese, uh, well, what some people call de facto alliance. Uh, uh, and this was, by the way, a nightmare for realists, uh, uh, even in the United States, people like Brzezinski or Kissinger, who uh, did not like uh, either Russia or China or communism in general. Uh, they warned for a long time that uh, the nightmare for the United States would be um, creation of an alliance or uh, a single country which would uh, dominate uh, Eurasia or whatever was called uh, Hotland by, by Mackinder and, 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 and his followers. Uh, um, but uh, realists are not playing important role in formulating U.S. and Western pol pol policy in, in general. So 
I would say that this is an additional factor. It's not the reason for Russian Chinese uh, rapprochement, but probably things would be uh, much slower if, if that factor was not there. And uh, the second half of it uh, was uh, uh, based on the idea that uh, the gap between Russia and China, because China is developing much uh, faster than Russia and its uh, might, its general power, including military power, is developing very fast. So this kind of uh, this kind of gap, in case it's uh, it's it, it grows in the future, uh, may bring um, some, and it's all uh, and it's already began to bring some about some apprehension in in in, in Russia in Moscow, uh, and the wish of Moscow to. Uh, pursue a kind of hedging policy, which is called in Moscow diversification of international relations, that uh, to, to not be too dependent uh, on China, because it's good to have such a good friend, but uh, it's probably not very wise to have it's uh, an only friend in the world or an only uh, partner in the world. So this was my uh, our main idea in this article that Russia would uh, not use balancing because you don't use balancing against a friend. Uh, it will not uh, uh, be bandwagoning China because uh, China, uh, because Russia is a big country and it's not going to bandwagon anyone, but hedging would probably be uh, the right term to, to describe the future of future Russia's approach. So this was, this was our main idea, and um, um, there was some criticism already that I received on all sides, but uh, I think it's an interesting, uh, the development of Russian-Chinese re relations, of course, is very important for both Russia and China, and it's a very interesting phenomenon, and we are going to continue studying it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexander. Alexander is going to be back um, with us for the Q&A session as well, so please prepare your questions. Um, we now are happy to um, give the floor to Ian Ferguson um, uh, for his presentation, please. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, there's been a slight change of um, order of speakers. I hope nobody minds. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. Uh, I wish to begin uh, in the same way that Anastasia began by expressing my thanks to the editors, the other editors, uh, Richard and Andre. Um, they were the ones that really made this special issue happen. Uh, Andre did a wonderful job in editing all the articles, including my own, um, and improving them all, uh, from what I saw at least. Um, and Richard provided leadership throughout. Um, without Richard on board, it'd be impossible, I think, for us to be discussing a published special issue, just a two months after all the articles were submitted. It's a remarkable quick turnaround. Um, so it's a great experience to be working with both of these editors as a kind of junior partner. Um, and uh, so my own article in this special issue is co-authored with uh, Higher School of Economics, a St. Petersburg professor, Sergei Akopov. Sergei has agreed to let me present this article uh, without him today. Uh, I'm the lead, lead author, but it was very much a collaborative effort. Um, so this article presents a new explanation of the international politics of Russian revisionism. And it does this by focusing on the practice of Russian diplomacy in a three year period between 2011 and 2014. Uh, so the explanation of Russian revisionism that we provide in this article is based around the following observations. The first one is that the practice of Russian diplomacy in today's world can only be understood in the context of global governance. Uh, more specifically, it can only really be understood in the context of decision making on the use of force by Western powers. That 2011 is a defining year for Russian diplomacy, because this was the, the, the year, the first time uh, in the post-Cold War period, where Russia provided its consent to the use of force by NATO for the humanitarian intervention in Libya. Um, now, this intervention is very controversial uh, within Russian political society but um, it was legally authorized uh, with um, the kind of, uh, with the support, the kind of tacit support by Russia in the Security Council. 
and it was substantively or normatively authorized by the norm of the responsibility to protect. So from a legal perspective, um, this event can be understood as an event of collective humanitarian intervention. Now, so the argument of this paper is that the revisionism of Russian diplomacy that justifies, ultimately justifies the incorporation of Crimea in early 2014 can only be understood as a political reaction to this authorization of humanitarian intervention three years earlier. Um, it, there was a very public, as I'm sure everyone will remember, there's very public kind of disagreement between uh, then Prime Minister Vladimir Putin and then President uh, Dmitry Medvedev over this decision to authorize the use of force, uh, support, the, support the use of force by NATO. Um, anyway, this whole practice of Russian diplomacy that we describe in this paper is historic insofar as it can only be made sense of between two events of Russian diplomacy in, the, in global governance. The first event is the, is the decision under Medvedev not to use Russia's veto um, uh, to prevent NATO's humanitarian intervention. Uh, the second event is Putin's decision to use Russia's uh, veto in 2014 to reject the motion that's tabled by the Western states of the Security Council, the P3, the UK, France, and, uh, and Britain, um, to invalidate the results of the Crimean referendum. So this, this was the seventh meeting on, uh, on, on the Ukraine crisis in 2014. Um, uh, and there's been many, there are many meetings since, and no doubt there will be many uh, to follow. Um, uh, it was, it, it was a, a motion that was tabled the day before the uh, Crimean referendum, and it was a proposal to invalidate the results, and it was it was vetoed uh, by uh, by Russia. So these events then of the non-use and the use of uh, Russia's veto provide the historical beginning and the conclusion to this paper on Russian diplomacy. But it's what happens in between these events uh, where the main findings are, and some of these findings are still to be fully uh, teased out and something for, for follow-up research. Um, let me just kind of briefly state what the main findings are. First of all, that Russian revisionism is justified in the practice of diplomacy in ways that are normative, ideological, and geopolitical. Uh, they're normative because this justification is made with reference to traditional values, values that are taken to be not just values for Russian political society, but common values that pertain to the whole of international society in ways that are presumed to be almost timeless. Uh, almost because there is a conscious time frame provided in the rhetoric on traditional values, particularly by Vladimir Putin, they're assumed to be um, a thousand years old. They're assumed to be the constitutive foundation of the modern society of states that coincides with the foundation of the Russian state. Um, now, the justification of revisionism is ideological because this understanding of the co-constitution of the Russian state and modern international society is explained with reference to the symbol of state civilization. Now this symbol first made its way into Russian politics back in 2005 in the shadow of the UN World Summit on the responsibility to protect. Um, and it comes into Russian political life courtesy of the writings of the conservative intellectual Mikhail Remazov in, back in 2005. But it only makes its way into the official language of Russian diplomacy um, after President-elect Vladimir Putin elaborates on the meaning of this symbol on the campaign trail for his third term. Uh, Putin refers to uh, state civilization throughout the three-year period that we, we deal with in this paper. Um, we don't really elaborate in the paper, this is something for follow-up work, on the ideological character of state civilization. We simply refer to it as a worldview uh, in Russian diplomacy and of global governance. Um, but this worldview, we argue, has permissive effects in terms of authorizing, self-authorizing Russia's use of force in Ukraine without any need to go to the Security Council. Um, now this self-authorization of the use of force is, I wish to argue in follow-up work, a key to understanding the, the character of contemporary Russian imperialism. Uh, in other words, imperialism in the context of global governance. Uh, and explain this with reference to the conservative ideological origins of state civilization and its geopolitical logic is something that I intend to follow up on in, for, in later work. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you so much, Ian. Um, we now have um, Professor Richard Sarko, please, um, who's gonna present um, on 
um, yeah, his article as well, please. Thanks very much, Olga. I'll, I'm going to talk in general, uh, not so much on our article, but just to, I will begin like everyone else of the editors and thank uh, the team, which has been great uh, to work with them. And I particularly want to uh, identify Professor Alexander Lukin for his uh, overall leadership of the whole project, the way that he connected us with people and pursued people. With disabilities. So huge thanks to him and, of course, to uh, the other uh, members of the team. Uh, Andre and Ian. It's been really a pleasure to work with them. Uh, a second point to, to say, suggest is that, um, you know, the question has often been put, you know, why on earth did we need such a special issue? Isn't there, after all, a vast amount of uh, articles in Russian foreign policy? What could we add? Uh, and so clearly, um, being academics, we were constant, and me being a Catholic as well, constantly pursued by doubts with a capital D, you know, really, is this uh, necessary? I think that the outcome has demonstrated that it is necessary and it was important. I've had quite a lot of feedback and uh, people have said it's actually hit a spot, uh, if you like, above all, because it has uh, identified and put together under one single cover the uh, various views, the diversity of views and the pluralism of views within the Russian uh, policy academic uh, community uh, and politicians. So uh, that, in, if only that was the outcome, then I think that our endeavor was a success. Uh, then of course, and uh, some of the underlying themes to this special issue, uh, and one of them was uh, precisely, is Russia a rising or a declining power? And I think uh, ultimately the, uh, the issue has demonstrated that those, both those terms are simplistic. Uh, they're reflected endlessly in op-eds in the New York Times and uh, elsewhere. But even if Russia was a declining power, even when it was in the 1990s, it was a fundamentally important uh, element in European and global state system, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, and indeed a uh, second, uh, if not the first, uh, nuclear power. So there's a uh, nuclear and um, not just uh, you know, nuclear weapons power. Uh, and of course now added with all sorts of other um, strategic and non-nuclear weapons, hypersonic, et cetera. But so not, neither the declinist or the rising position are adequate, but both need to be analyzed in their own terms. And that, I think the, uh, the this, uh, various articles have reflected that and the conditions in which that's developing. And, you know, a specific point uh, is that uh, I, I was you know, really delighted that uh, Vladimir Gishkov was uh, contributing to our issue, uh, and I'm delighted that he participated in the discussion today. Uh, not only because it's always fascinating to hear Vladimir, uh, for, who's got a long experience uh, as engagement with these issues and all, at all levels, both the academic and the political level, but uh, also uh, because perhaps his views as, uh, you know, as a Europeanist, uh, particularly uh, ones which I wanted to have aired uh, to, uh, and put out there. In other words, to what extent can we return to an agenda outlined at the end of the 1980s, uh, uh, you know, formulated in, in a form of new political thinking, which really was, which we now see with a perspective of 30 years, quite revolutionary. It was really an attempt to fundamentally change the foundations of uh, European and indeed therefore uh, global politics, and it did in certain ways, but we obviously uh, lost it. And this is uh, going to be, I think our team is going to be pursuing that and in particular with Andrei Krikovic. Uh, so, uh, but we lost it. And I think uh, Vladimir gave some very good reasons and other uh, contributors have given a, a range of factors. But, you know, when we come to the q and I'll just put in my first bit, you know, how, you know, in other words, we can't repeat that experience of a new political thinking, because clearly it didn't provide an adequate foundation with a security order that came afterwards. That in other words, we need obviously new political, new new political thinking, but you know, what on earth is the foundation? Because a new political thinking was gestated in the, for 30 years, if not a hundred years before 1989, 91. And you know, at the moment we can't really see where these new ideas are coming from, where is the new thinking? And what's the social and political and institutional basis for this new thing? And uh, so while I uh, really do think that, you know, the aspiration to go to a, uh, a new type of uh, common European home is fantastic because Russia, for all the reasons outlined, is a European, a cultural power. Yet, of course, there's something 
something else going on. Two other things I'd like to identify is that obviously the key contradiction is between that continentalist vision, which uh, Vladimir put forward and others, uh, and the Atlanticism. And so even the notion of Euro-Atlantic security, even the word Euro-Atlantic no longer exists. Either we have an Atlantic version or we have a continental version, though there's not much in the continental basket as at moment. the moment, you know, Gaulism is uh, marge and so on. So, but this tension between, uh, a, you know, the enlargement of the uh, Atlantic system after 1989, 91, NATO enlargement, etc., and the transformation of that system as outlined by the new political thinking and Gorbachev and so on, is maps on, of course, to the security order established in OSCE in the 1990s and NATO. The tension uh, is an institutional one as well. And obviously we know that the OSCE did fantastic work early and continues to do so, by the way, which we often forget, but it's obviously been occluded and marginalized. And uh, so, but that takes me to uh, another point, which is that what we're seeing today is, if you like, the great sorting. Uh, just as within the United States, we see Democrats and Republicans hardly mixing with each other, hardly tolerating each other. So on the global level, uh, that we are, we are seeing a Eurasia emerging, as uh, previous speakers have suggested, as an independent subject of politics, as a type of heartland politics, Makinda, etc. And in other words, that maybe we've missed the boat. And in other words, there's no way back. You can have as much new political thinking as you like. But is, I mean, in other words, are we just in danger of repeating earlier failures? And of course, uh, the final point is that uh, at the moment, this great sorting and uh, that the, the we were, and as uh, Sergei Alexandrovich Karyoganov quite eloquently has demonstrated, that we are, uh, you know, that, that things were in an impasse uh, on a plateau uh, with a declining plateau, if a plateau can even be sloping downwards. But nevertheless, it was, uh, you know, and the, now the talks of red lines of, you know, a, a final stand. If you're going to put red lines, then they have to be credible. You know, Obama still being condemned for uh, his uh, not maintaining the red line in Syria in 2013. And of course, Russia has talked about red lines before, about NATO enlargement in the first place. And so this is about the third or fourth iteration of red lines. But ultimately, the credibility is that, you know, if you really start pushing them, where are you going to, uh, you know, how are you going to fulfill it? And, you know, is there a, a way out? I mean, even Brzezinski, for example, talking about Ukrainian moment, talked at the end about the neutrality for Ukraine. And this is Brzezinski, the one who'd been pushing for that sorting and ensuring uh, that there was no way forwards. Neutrality, of course, can take many uh, forms, but there's absolutely no way in which that's going to be achieved because the way that Europe uh, has developed, the way that the Atlantic system has developed, the failure to, uh, to enunciate a genuine continental agenda. So, um, uh, well, those are some of the issues which were discussed in this special issue. And so uh, thanks to all the contributors. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, we now have some concluding remarks from Andre as well. Well, thank you. I just want to thank Olga and Alexander for giving us the opportunity to present the special issue to this wider audience. Of course, all of our contributors, the editing team, Richard's inspired leadership to make this happen in a very quick turnaround. Uh, you can see that, you know, this was a very uh, meaningful kind of endeavor. And uh, Sergei Alexandrovich's comments today show that maybe we need to start thinking about another, you know, the second special issue to follow on this one. So uh, working with Richard Sakwa is, uh, you know, one of the only negative things is sometimes you have to follow him in speaking, and he's always said all the interesting and uh, profound things. <laughs> and I want to keep my uh, comments short because I'm sure there are a lot of uh, interesting questions. And I see we have a very uh, interesting and uh, distinguished uh, group here that's uh, come to this seminar. So I'll just say that, uh, you know, when we were kind of uh, big D, the big doubt, why do we need this special issue? Well, one of the things is that, uh, you know, we have a very rich uh, IR and area studies literature about Russian foreign policy, but not so often does it give a voice to Russian specialists, Russian experts, Russian scholars to really kind of address international issues. Very often, you know, it deals with motivations, be it regime type or, you know, realism in terms of security or, you know, uh, constructivism in terms of ideology and identity. 
But, you know, giving these people uh, a chance to really kind of in a subjective scholarly way address these issues gets overlooked. And I think that that really has denied Russian scholars and experts voice and even agency in much of the literature. So I felt that this was a corrective, uh, our issue. And, you know, there's a diversity of views here. There's stuff that comes kind of as a surprise. So I think it'll be interesting for uh, you know, people that, you know, do follow this closely. I think uh, some of these ideas about hedging in the China relationship, that the European dream, the common European home isn't dead. And, you know, uh, uh, Professor uh, Rishkov certainly gave a very eloquent uh, statement to that effect in his article. And the fact that, you know, the concerns of Russia aren't just kind of parochial and, you know, limited to Russia, Russia's interests, Russia's sphere of influence, holding on to great power status, but there are also, you know, these bigger concerns that we all have about, you know, the fate of humanity and how do we deal with these larger IR problems. So, and this is uh, Vladimir Lukin's article in a very kind of profound and uh, deeply philosophical way he deals with this. So it was a pleasure to deal with all of these things. I encourage everybody to look at it. I'm very encouraged that people are interested, that we seem to be hitting a little nerve and generating some interest. And with that, I'll end my exposition and open it up, leaving time for the questions from our audience. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Andre. This is great. Um, very pleased to see that we had such a wonderful team um, put together. Um, so uh, we do have quite a few participants um, in the audience today. It was um, about 50 people earlier now, um, slightly um, fewer. However, um, if um, you'd like to um, start initiate a discussion, um, please let us know. Um, I'm sure there'll be hands. Okay, so Olga Kresnev um, is a fellow at HSC as well. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question, thanks. Uh, okay, yes, can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much for this uh, discussion. It was very interesting. Uh, my name is Olga Krasniak. I'm a researcher of diplomatic studies of uh, the same department. And my question goes to, um, uh, to Richard, uh, if I may. So Richard, you are uh, a very profound researcher of, of Russia. And uh, I've read uh, uh, the introduction of the special issue very carefully. And the main idea you say it's about uh, whether is Russia is declining or ri uh, rising power. And uh, I would like to ask you maybe not about this, but maybe from uh, the liberal world order perspective, because if we look uh, at liberalism as an idea or is a theory of international relations, we can uh, identify these three main ideas. Uh, political view, economic view, and institutionalized view. And from political point of view, of course, Russia does not push the idea to promote liberal values. We, uh, we, it's, it is what it is. Uh, but we're not that alien to human rights, for example, and all these issues related to, to, to this type of values. From economic perspective, uh, Russia's involvement in world economy is, uh, is, is important, of course. And as uh, Anastasia Likachova, she uh, put it out, uh, sanctions, uh, are very destructive and they limit Russia's international involvement. And basically it's something what we can relate to liberalism, this uh, world open economy. And from uh, the third point of view, and uh, Ian Ferguson, he told about this uh, institutionalized perspective and diplomatic perspective in Russia's diplomacy, uh, it's very consistent for, for the decades. And uh, from this institutionalized point of view, um, Russia, uh, of course, is very important member of international organizations, many of them. Uh, Russia continues um, just to maintain uh, international treaties and agreements. And uh, we've mentioned about the Arctic and uh, the Antarctic and the Paris Agreement as well. So, uh, in fact, actually, Russia is not that alien to liberal world order, even we may be uh, not happy to call it this way. So, so Richard, so what's, so what's your opinion? So no matter how we can call it this way, uh, but Russia's foreign policy, it's not that stranger to, to liberalism, in fact. Oh, I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Olga, for uh, having researched our special issue in such a detail. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for your question, Olga, and your comments, even in your exposition, which I think was exceptionally helpful, because you're absolutely right. And may I just add to your list, you talk about politics, economics, institutions, you could, I mean, um, picking up on uh, Ferguson Akopov paper, you could stress perhaps a little bit more the normative side of things, but in, you know, in the sense ideational, but indeed, you're absolutely right. 
your bottom line, Russia is not alien to that, you know, the, the, the fundamental concepts, and I think that was in Vladimir's paper and others as well, uh, to the uh, principle, the underlying principles of uh, liberal order. That is, ex you know, and uh, you're absolutely right, but there is one thing. So may I just spend two seconds just outlining my model of how the world works in, in five seconds, um, which basically I've been arguing for some time now that uh, we have, after 1945, there was uh, the establishment of, uh, you know, picking up on and Clunan and others' work, a, a charter international system, the United Nations system. Some people used to call it the Yalta international system. Some people call it the Wilsonian international system. Let's call it neutral, the charter international system and the vast system of international law, which has then been emerging at genocide conventions, everything, you know, a whole stack of stuff. And that is the historical epoch in which we live. So it's just over 75 odd years. Uh, of that order. Of course, Soviet Union, China, uh, as well as the United States, UK, were founding members of that system. But within that international system, now of course, this is all English school type stuff, um, they, within that international system, we have political orders. Now, one of them is a liberal international order. After 1989-91, Russia, indeed, as you say, was not alien to it. It wanted to join it. And so, again, vast uh, stuff on this, but I don't want to take too much time. But I'll just say simply, the objection that Russia had to it was the claim after 1989, it wanted to join that modest version of liberal internationalism. Unfortunately, it changed its spots and became liberal internationalism, became liberal hegemony. And that's a different beast entirely because it, adds to the liberal institutionalism, all that good stuff you talk, you, you allude to, it added to it a geopolitical hegemonic dimension. And that Russia even was, was willing in the 1990s to work with it if the OSCE could establish a framework for security and so on. But as we know, it couldn't and it failed. And uh, the, the objection that Russia has today is the claim that the liberal international order and the rules-based order is synonymous with order itself. They said, no, look, it's a charter international system is the foundation of international law. And so, but the point is, you're absolutely right. My view is, is that this Russo-Chinese alignment and others isn't so much, you know, is oh, certainly the Russian side of it, isn't opposed to the, the fundamental principles at the heart of the LIO, but it's hege hegemonic ambitions to claim it's synonymous with order itself and to say that there has to be space for sovereign internationalism uh, within that thing. So, as you say, it's not a simple black or white or complex, as this uh, language of democracy versus autocracy is just last week, Biden had that rather odd conference on that subject. So, you know, I fundamentally agree with your, you know, your position and where you're going, but with that other added edge to understand how these why we're in the geopolitical co um, confrontation today, which is uh, that geopolitics and the, you know, in other words, the power and the norms diverged. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Richard, for your answer. So the, um, I think Olga alluded to more speakers as well. So Ian was mentioned. Uh, so if you'd like to call, jump in and comment at any point, please let me know. <laughs> um, all right. So um, if uh, we're happy to move to the um, next question. Um, we have something from Anne Phillips in the chat. And would you like to unmute yourself, please, um, and ask it? Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for this. I look forward to reading the articles. So uh, my question is specifically to Professor Rishkoff, if he could just elaborate on a comment about the different conditions necessary for improving Russian EU relations. One was the international factor of a minimal consensus on the neighborhood. I think I may understand that, but I would appreciate a more detailed explanation of what that means in practice. And the fact that Armenia was mentioned specifically as a country that could have good relations with the EU, as well as Russia. Um, of course, the EU has its neighborhood policy, their long-standing relations between the EU and Armenia, and if that would apply to all of the South Caucasus, um, uh, Georgia, as well as uh, Azerbaijan. Thank you. Actually, Anne, I just realized that uh, Professor Rishkov may have um, 
unjoined oh, <laughs> the <no>. meeting. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm actually well, no, uh, we are happy. <laughs> um, we ha I'm happy to email your question to him because it's already um, in the chat anyways. Um, and hopefully he'll get <laughs> get back to you about it. Um, in the meantime, if any of the other speakers would like to comment on Anne's question so that I could uh, close this I have, one. I actually have a, another question, if I might. Since oh, I, please. A, a more general one. In, in Washington, I'm in Washington, D.C., and there have been many, many um, sessions on the implosion, if you will, of the Soviet Union 30 years after and very different perspectives on that, what happened, what could have been done, et cetera. And I was just curious if you all are having similar conversations, revisiting the implosion of the Soviet Union, the key factors involved, what might've happened differently, alternative to what actually happened. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure these conversations happen all the time at any <laughs> level, starting from the kitchen, ending with the more academic circles. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, thank you. Uh, Richard, would you like to start? Yeah, just on that first question, the one to, uh, I don't want to uh, step for into uh, Vladimir Gushkov too much, but uh, one of our articles in a special issue does deal with that, the Andrei Kazantsev, Lebedev, Svetlana Medvedeva article, I think really nicely uh, outlines precisely this Armenian dimension. They, they outline two dynamics in post-Soviet or former Soviet space, uh, and basically, again, based on geopolitics. That in other words, it isn't so much in, as long as these countries do not, you know, from the perception of Moscow, threaten geopolitically, they can do what they like. And so, and so there's two dynamics involved. And so do have a look at the article and it would, um, in part, though it's a shame that Vladimir Yushkov wasn't able to answer it. As for the fall collapse of the Soviet Union, first of all, I think, you know, I've always argued there's two things going on. One is that dissolution of the communist system. And uh, as uh, Archie Pian and others argue, by 1989, the Soviet system, the old communist system had effectively uh, dissolved. And I use the word specifically dissolved because you know, from the word dissolution, it wasn't, in other words, that, you know, jo Johan Arneson, uh, excellent book, you know, The Future That Failed, uh, outlines rather nicely the, the fact that, you know, as a type of modernity, it wasn't anti-modern, but it was a type of modernity which uh, proved unsustainable in those conditions for various reasons, above all the arms race with uh, the United States, etc. So that's the dissolution side. The other side is the disintegration of the Soviet Union as those federal republics and so on. And that is what obviously uh, we've just, uh, well, December uh, 30 years ago at uh, Bielovieja Pusha just, ha just had it. So you're absolutely right, it's been a big thing, but it is important to keep that the two things apart. Of course, that Bielovieja Pusha uh, is still hugely contro controversial. For example, the, the discussion which we now know did take place about Sevastopol and Crimea there. Uh, for example, at uh, Bielovice, there was the talk about, you know, what's going to happen uh, about with a fleet. And that's why they decided, and Ukraine uh, actually committed itself to a joint military command within the CIS. And Marshal Shaposhnikov was appointed uh, head of it. But of course, that was going to be unsustainable. All these countries would want their own armed forces. Uh, but nevertheless, this was yet another of those factors uh, going on. Uh, so, as I said, key point the distinction between dissolution of the political system, if you like, the order, and it's moving towards democracy. And let me just add one other point, which we sometimes forget, is that Russia, quite apart from the, you know, the tensions between Yeltsin and Gorbachev, there was a democratic revolution in Russia at that time, whose impetus continues. And that's why particularly, uh, you know, it was welcome to have, you know, it's not just that I don't want to go on about Vladimir Gushkov, but to see him today as a deputy in the uh, Moscow City Duma is for some of us who have followed and worked uh, with uh, Vladimir over the years, it's, you know, really great to see that in some ways this democratic, the impetus is not over and that the dynamic and so on. And of course, uh, you know, Russia um, claims to be a democratic country, and uh, that's fundamentally important. It's not claiming to be an alternative modernity. That's the big lesson of 1989-91, but it claims to uh, represent perhaps um, mistakenly to be perhaps even a better version of modernity than the declining uh, West. But obviously that is a rather ambitious statement, which I think 
uh, is contentious to say the least. Thanks. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, we have a question from uh, Nils, um, and I believe it's a question to Alexander. So we're happy to have Alexander back with us as well. Yeah, yeah and thank you very much for the very interesting panel. In, in general, my question was directed to Professor Lukin because I read uh, both the article and witnessed the discussion that this was embedded in and the misrepresentations in, in general terms. And for me, what I found quite interesting is that this kind of misrepresentation um, for instance, how, how the diplomat, how it was presented as the diplomat, as one of the leading China scholars in Russia, uh, talks neg negatively on, on, on the prospects of the trajectories, future trajectories of Sino Russian relations. And um, while this seems to represent a lot of, uh, I'd say, wedging hopes, uh, at least in, in the Western audience, what I find quite interesting um, uh, to see is what is the Chinese perspective on that? Because I, I think a few years back, Yuan Fung Kong uh, from um, National University of Singapore, he published a very uh, a popular book on the importance of perceptions of historical analogies. And I was curious if the Western discourse, like uh, Kup Chan this summer wrote an article about wedging, and there have been many more articles on how to wedge and uh, separate Russia and China. If and this discourse alone, uh, basically feeds into the perceptions of historical analogies of China um, fearing becoming alienated or is the um, promulgated uh, strategic partnership between Russia and China already so deep that these kind of entrapment and abandonment fears that accompany every alignment um, are basically overcome to a sense that um, the Chinese know to, to, in a scholarly perspective but also policymakers that this is it's not really realistic to happen anytime soon. Alexander, that was to you. We can't hear you. Okay, now you, now you can hear me. Well, I'm not sure if it was a question or not, but of course perceptions are important. Uh, the, uh, the Chinese perception of uh, this alliance is, uh, well, I described it uh, quite, uh, extensively in my book, which was published in 2018. But the ba basic idea is that uh, China is interested in Russia, mainly as a geopolitical partner, because China, without Russia, would be almost alone. China has no allies in the world. Well, official ally is only North Korea. It has some friends like uh, Pakistan, but not many. So without Russia, there was one interesting book of uh, a Chinese, Chinese, Chinese military expert who wrote, it was uh, called C-shape encirclement, which means that, uh, you know, the West uh, with, a C, with, with, a, with its military alliances um, basically encircles China and, and tries, to contain, tries to contain its uh, development, but there is kind of a hole in this ring or a uh, Yes, and this hole is uh, basically, well, he doesn't say it specifically, but we can assume that it's Russia, probably Central Asian friendly countries. Uh, so China also needs Russia as an economic partner. It's not very, the Russia, Russia's role in China's trade is not, international trade is not uh, very big, but it's important because nobody sells arm armaments to China, for example, uh, only, only Russia because of Western embargo. Also, it needs some um, raw materials, like uh, uh, for for because China has some energy problems and and so on. So, uh, it's important from the from the Chinese point of view, and uh, to separate Russia from China. Well. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I know that many Western authors write about it. Uh, there is a group uh, which says that Russia should be used against uh, China. Others say that China should be used against Russia. But even from this point of view, I think the current uh, foreign policy is rather silly. I would say. <laughs> Uh, because it's it's absolutely real, unrealistic. If, if, if you even, even if you think from this uh, in these terms, which would uh, some realists do? You know, like Kissinger, for example, used China against Russia because 
China was weaker at that time. Now they might say that Russia is weaker, so it's from the you know real, realist perspective. It it, it may be it may it may be a, a, be a good idea to use Russia against China. But you but but for that they should change the entire uh, world view, the current ideological kind of liberal expansionist worldview. You know, you, you need to be a pragmatic to do this thing. But I cannot see a, a single pragmatic in the American leadership at, at the moment. So uh, something very serious should happen. You know, they had another, uh, uh, they became, became more pragmatic after Vietnam. But now they had the second Vietnam, Afghanistan. It did make them pragmatic for some reason. Uh, uh, so I don't think it's it's even possible for the West uh, to even to think about within their kind of current ideological paradigm, even to think about changing their policies. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we had a wonderful session today. Um, I do thank all the participants uh, and contributors and editors uh, and or editors because editors also wrote some articles. Um, as well, we're very happy to have so many um, opinions represented here, um, and it's great that we can all work together and we look forward to more sessions. Um, the next one, by the way, is happening already on the 20th of December, and it's going to be with our very own Richard, who is here. So we are very excited about that, and we do hope that uh, many of the participants who heard Richard today will be um, captivated by his uh, talent <laughs> in telling us <laughs> all kinds of stories about international relations. Um, so I personally very much look forward to Richard's uh, presentation um, and I look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks a lot. Um, and this is, this is it folks for now. <laughs> so I do hope everybody um, will join us for more seminars later on. Cheers. <laughs>